Hello and welcome to the back row on Air Sport. In a week when Brexit once again dominated the headlines in the UK, there was only one story here this week. It was Joe Exit. Joining me this week are Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent and Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times. Never a quiet week in Irish rugby, guys, as always. Even after the November test, we had a, another big story. I guess we did our best to try and maybe warn people that this was coming a little bit. But the surprise, I guess, Jerry, was that Joe announced he's going to finish coaching. Now, no mention of retirement, mm. and he's an English teacher, so he knows the value of words. Mm. Were, were you surprised by that? What do you think that means? Uh, yeah, that was the jarring thing about it. We all knew it was coming, really, but it was the words finish coaching, and it was in the heading on the press release from the RFU. It was in the first sentence in the wording from the RFU, and then, just in case we're left in any doubt, go straight into a quote from Joe Schmidt, I've decided to finish coaching after the Rugby World Cup. So we went, OK, we get the message, he's finishing coaching. And this tells us he's definitely taking an indefinite break, for family reasons, as he said all along. He doesn't want to be pestered with job offers, doesn't want to be linked with any job offers. He's going back to New Zealand. I don't know what way he's going to divvy up his time, but it's going to be more family time and take a break. It was very interesting when he spoke to us, wasn't it, in the daily huddle after the game, and he talked about being a workaholic and how much yeah. this consumes him. And I remember doing an interview with him last February, and he said, it's a lonely job, you know what I mean? I just think he's, he increasingly gives more and more. He describes himself as a cog in the machine, but we all know he... He invented the machine, he drives the machine. Yeah. Rory, do you expect to see him back in the short-term future? Do you think he's waiting for the right opportunity, maybe? Or what do you think he is there? I think he, if he does come back, it'll be on his own terms, and he's making sure of that. That's what he's trying to control in this process. I would be very, it's very hard to imagine Joe Schmidt as a civilian. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever about imagining, imagining him being a, co a teacher back in Palmerston North, years ago, he was still had a very large involvement in rugby back then. It's very hard to see Joe Schmidt that we know, this, like, you know we don't see the, the family side of him really, we only see the professional side. And he's such, a, he's obsessed with rugby. East of the Sea, we'll call him Mr. Rugby. It's very hard to imagine this man without rugby in his life to some degree. And, and there will be, I'm sure, an itch after six months or two a year. Like, I don't see him picking pick up the pipe and slippers anytime soon to be drawn back into it. And, and for all that he, he, he does and wants, offers, he doesn't want to be linked with jobs, he will, he's too big a name, mm -hmm. he's too established, he's too widely respected, so I'm sure it won't be long after he lands before the European phone numbers start appearing on his phone, but, you know, I'm sure that the, uh, the New Zealand hierarchy will be checking on him every so often going, are you sure? His, his resistance will be tested quite frequently, I'm sure the Lions will be interested, I'm sure the All Blacks will be. Um, you know, people will want him as a consultant. The big money in France is, is still there. Well, he much, has any more, any more Saturday nights like the last one in the Stade de France with France and Bernard Laporte will be on him very yeah, soon. Absolutely, yeah. you know. So I mean, he's going to be in demand whether he likes it or not. Yeah. If you keep saying no, maybe he'll disappear. But I just find it so hard to see him walking away completely. I can see a, a, a bit, a nice long period to give him a break from the game to concentrate on the family, which is, you know, he has been very consistent throughout this process, yeah. saying it's about family, but. You know, I, I think this, there'll be, there will be an itch there that he'll want to scratch again, even if he goes and wins the World Cup with Ireland. It's very difficult when you're a workaholic who loves rugby and is obsessed with rugby to walk away from it. Yeah, it'll be fascinating. I'd say he'll be watching plenty of Mitre 10 Cup and all the rest of it, as he always does. Is the Lions maybe one, Jerry? Should they be thinking, here's our opportunity, he, he wants a bit of a break. 2021 is the next tour. Should, should they be going after him now and try and get that done early? I'm sure they, that, that would be an option. It would be, a, it would be like a short-term contract as such. It wouldn't be as time-consuming until that very intense period of the summer that the tour actually happens in. It's a watching brief. Although it's more time-consuming than you would imagine. And I know this from doing Warren Gatlin's diary that, you know, the lines have to pay their own way because they're not subsidised. So they do, there's a lot of commercial activities. There's a lot more demands on the head coach lines a year out than you would imagine. And uh, I still think that's unlikely, personally, mm -hmm. myself. I'd be surprised if that happens. And the other thing about all this, all the speculation we might want to do, the longer he takes away from the game, does it then become more unlikely that he comes back in? You know what I mean? Pep Guardiola took, what, a year? Yeah. You know, after a year or two years, three years, uh, there comes a point when you actually have to do something else. <laughs> you say goodbye. So you can, you can see him never come I think come it's back possible. Terrific. Definitely possible. Yeah. yeah, definitely possible. What about you, Rory? Do you think, I think it's happens? possible. I think he's, he's certainly... That's the way... If you read the statement at face value... That's what he's saying. I just think completely walking away forever seems unlikely to me. Just from the, the man that you know that we've dealt with over the last couple of years, that I, I you know I know a little bit. 
I just find it so hard to believe that he would be able to part completely with rugby. Whether that's coaching the under 16s down, mm. where, where you know, if he goes back to teaching, which I think is probably unlikely, but if he does, does he take the senior team? Does he just take it on a more social, uh, more social level? Very hard to do that when you've been at the top end of the game, de dealing with committed professionals like the Irish rugby team are. That he speaks so highly of this this, this group of men that he that he is able to mould into this high performing team. But if you work in high performance, you're you're, you're addicted to high performance. Mm. I don't know how you now. Do you take that those, that skill set and try a new challenge completely and go into business? I'm not sure. He won't be shy of offers in yeah. any field. He's such an impressive individual with such an amazing record and such an attention to detail in, in every regard that I think he could apply that to any way. And I don't see him pitching up at TV studios anytime soon or having a newspaper column or anything like that. That's yeah. the side of the game that I don't think he'd be part of. I you think, regard the media as the dark side, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> He'll be good inside. Yeah, yeah. It would be, be, yeah. He, he had a column with our paper once, but one time only on Super Rugby. I just think that it, I find it difficult to see him walking away completely, but at the same time, yeah. He's very in, he's an independent man yeah. and he will he's no ordinary Joe. Yeah. If he walks, he walks. And if that's his decision, him yeah. and Kelly, that's the way they want to go, he'll go that way. You could he could do anything. You could see him come back and pitch up an Ireland and run the Leinster Academy. Do what Eric L would do. Just decide, oh, this head coaching job is too intense for me, but I'd love to still be involved in the game. He could yeah. he could take any route. The one good thing about this, I suppose, is that at least he's not going to be coaching against Ireland anytime soon. And yeah. Irish rugby got the best nine years out of the best coach in the world. Yeah, well that brings on to, to Ireland. What are what are the RFU losing beyond just this incredible head coach who comes up with these incredibly detailed plays? His role is a lot more than just that team, isn't it? And I think the statement recognised that that he is. Uh, it, there's, you don't have to do much dusting to find his fingerprints all over Irish rugby. He has a finger in every pie. He appears at games that you that most of us don't even know are on. You know, he spotted Jordan Larmour playing for St Andrews against a, a, a touring New Zealand side when he was just 16 or 17. Mm. You know, he has taken an, an approach to, to, that this is not just turn up on a Saturday, play a game. It, it is an all-encompassing role. He goes to clubs, speaks at dinners, often doesn't take a fee. More often than not, as far as I'm aware, doesn't take a fee for that sort of role. He he will take a call from a player who's coming through in the under-19s in Connacht as quickly as he'll take a call from Peter O'Mahony. He, he is grooming players that we don't, haven't even heard of to play for Ireland in the future. And I think it's possible, I know we're going to go on to Andy Farrell later, at least he, he will walk away with Ireland in a far better place from when he, than when he found it, in that he has been succession planning from, from a team perspective for a long time. But it's more than that, he's helping the coaches. He, he's, you know, Jared Payne was in camp that last week before the USA game because he wants him to be a successful coach. The rest of the Ulster team were there. He is just... He is all things to Irish rugby at the moment. Sometimes the national team work against the provinces. There will be a bit of friction there. But I think the overall ship or the overall uh, tide has lifted with him there undoubtedly. And his his impact will last lo far longer than the time he was here. He'll turn up at under-16, under-15 schools cup matches. He arranged that game for James Ryan. Do you remember to play down in Munster after his year out for the yeah. game? I mean, his, his influence is everywhere. And um, it would be safe. I was thinking about it coming in tonight, Murray. Has there ever been a more influential figure in the history of Irish rugby? Probably not, yeah. Tom Kiernan, maybe, something like that. Brian O'Driscoll, obviously. Yeah. But he's right up there as amongst the most influential figures we've ever known in the history of Irish rugby. When you think, all to think of his three years with Leinster. And like eight, seven trophies in eight years, whatever it's been with Leinster and Ireland, four trophies at Leinster, three Six Nations titles, plus trophies for winning series in Australia, and whatever else. It's, it's not just that, it's just that he's, as Shane Horgan said during the week, he's left an indelible imprint, a mark on Irish rugby and on lots of individuals in between. Andrew Conway talking about the time he was out of the team, still getting feedback from Joe and what he needed to prove at the game. God knows how many players were getting this feedback from Joe. And I don't think Andy Farrell or anybody else could possibly do the same work. And this is partly why he's leaving because yeah. it, was, it did consume him so much and he was so devoted to it. Yeah, as David Newsofor says, his job is not done yet. It's quite demanding no. to, to expect another 11 months of the same success, but that is what Joe will demand of himself. How well said are Ireland Rory in your eyes to, to finish his time with a really positive final chapter? Well, I don't think we've ever seen Ireland go into the turn of a World Cup cycle in such good stead. I mean, 2018 was a remarkable year, and you know, if you remove it from the World Cup cycle and put it in isolation, it's, it is Ireland's greatest year in any at any level of rugby. You know, yeah. throw in Leinster's success as well. It's quite quite an incredible 12 months, um, and so it's right. They have set a standard that if they hit that standard again, they will go and succeed in the Six Nations. They will go and succeed in the World Cup. Does it guarantee them? You know, to win the tournament, does it even get guaranteed them to get past the quarterfinal? No, because it's not that easy. They're going to be playing against one of the two, two one of the two traditionally strongest teams in the world in that quarterfinal. And on the day, you know, Joe Schmidt has always talked about fine margins. Those they come in, but he will give them every chance. He, he, his levels of preparation, the 
strategic planning that he's done over the, the three years so far, the rotating players for big games, leaving Johnny Sexton out of the first test in Australia to give Joey Carby a run. Everything he has done, I think, has been towards, in this cycle, has been towards next year and that World Cup. Yeah. And there, this That's why Joey Carby's at Munster. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, all these yeah, things. That's you know, why Simon Zebo was exiled as soon as he yeah. left. You know, unpopular decisions that you know were criticised. Why Tyke Byrne came back. Like, yeah. All, the, all those things, things are all part of that. Yeah. that you know, recruiting Will Addison, who yeah. a lot of Irish people have never heard of. All little, just little building blocks that are all towards next year. And I think they are set up to succeed, and I would expect them to succeed given what we've seen in the last 18 months. Like, we've seen how much it hurt him in 2015, that Argentina yep. game. A lot of it was out of yep. hand with the injuries, we should recognise that. But how do you think Joe's going to manage that insatiable desire to finish on a high there and, and right that wrong with giving the players enough freedom, enough space and not being overbearing? He's, he's spoken to you about how he worries that he demands too much of the players. How yeah, he's balance? spoken about it. Like, he genuinely fears that some of the Leinster players who've had him for eight and a half years are just tired of his message and that they need a fresh voice. And yet you heard Reese Ruddock saying last Friday, and Reese Ruddock would not be a regular in the team, and he's, he joined Leinster a year before Joe did, and he said the, the message is as fresh as ever. And that's what Brian O'Driscoll and Johnny Sexton, Sean O'Brien, and all these players who say he's the best coach they've ever worked with, that his ideas are fresh, and his training sessions are always worth looking forward to. They actually look forward to it. And I think with a now 11, knowing that the end game is in sight, he'll be able to concentrate even more freely in this, knowing that it's his last crack at it. And there's two things I like about this Irish squad compared to all other squads that have been to World Cups before and this glass ceiling of a quarter-final. One is obviously the winning mentality, 18 wins out of the last 19, and they're, they're winning in clutches. You know, they're winning a grand slam, which is five games in seven weeks. They're winning a three-match series away from home in Australia. They're doing clean sweeps the last two Novembers in a row of three matches and four matches. So they're proving they can work, and they're using a full squad to do this. They've never really had a strength and depth like this before. An Irish team, a bit like an All Blacks team now, with the second side, will pulverise a, a Tier 2 team in the pool stages of a World Cup, and that keeps momentum going. That means everybody's involved in the squad. The right of the caveat to all of this, of course, is that Ireland are the second favourites, but they're almost certainly going to meet either the favourites or the third favourites in the quarter-final, which makes it the most difficult quarter-final draw they've ever had. He, yeah. he learned. In 2014, we went to Argentina, and all the reports from behind the scenes were that it was way too intense, that like, there was mm. meetings upon meetings about meetings. You know, it was really over the top. Last year, they went to Australia for three weeks, and South Africa previously, much more relaxed. The lads went off jet skiing in the first week. It was all, you know, he'd step back a little bit from He learned from the... And if he hasn't learned... You know, he's, all he's done for the last three years is learn for 2015 and the intensity of that environment at the time in that quarter-final week was way OTT, the way they managed Paul O'Connell's injury, all that stuff. He, you would imagine he's learned from that because that's what he's been doing that every Argentina day Argentina tour yeah. would have been his yeah. first ever test yeah. tour as yeah. a head coach. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a learning so he's experience. A, he's a better coach now yeah. than he was when he started. So he's, yeah. he's pretty well so for Going to be a really interesting final year for, for Joe. Coming up after the break, we'll look ahead to a new era for the Ireland team as an Englishman takes charge. And I don't mean Mick McCarthy. You're very welcome back. Well, Rory, Andy Farrell is the next man on the hot seat when Joe does depart. Um, very popular with the players, obviously, and has built up an incredible CV as an assistant coach. Is he a good appointment as head coach in, in your eyes? I think if you're going to the market and you look at the candidates that are out there, I think Andy Farrell stands pretty much toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone that's out there based on the CV that he does have. He knows the players, he knows the system, he's worked with two of the provinces, visited the others, um, He's had international experience, albeit not as a top man. And I think that is probably the one caveat or the one concern that you might have is that he doesn't have head coaching experience. But he has all the attributes, I think, personality-wise, to be the top man. I think he's learned at, underneath some great coaches in some great environments. I mean, people talk about Saracens as being the leading club, then Ireland are currently you know, one of the leading nations, if not the leading nation in the world. He's been at you know, watching Joe Schmidt work for a couple of years. He'll take all the things that he thinks are good about Joe Schmidt and put them alongside the things that make him a very good coach. And it's a massive job. Following Joe Schmidt, I, like Matt O'Connor will, you know, all he has to do is pick up the phone with Matt O'Connor to find out what it's like to follow Joe Schmidt. Yeah. The players are, you know, are enshrined in this one way of doing things. Some of them have been doing it for almost a decade. That's going to be his challenge. But he's seen that way and he will have a plan. He's had enough time to think about this, to have a plan to negotiate those waters. But it won't be easy. I think it's going to be a difficult job. I mean, if you think about it, 2016 was one of Ireland's worst years. The World Cup takes an awful lot out of an international team. Mm. And if he takes over and has a similar enough year, he doesn't have the credit in the bank that Joe does. So there is a little bit of, there are a lot of risks for him. But at the same time, he, he, is, an, an, he is an outstanding candidate and a guy who would give you a lot of confidence in what he he's able to do based on the record that he yeah. has. It's not going to be easy as a tour to uh, New Zealand, rather, two years into the job. Jerry, is that lack of head, head coach experience, is that a big issue, do you think? Or 
is the stuff Rory mentioned there, is that enough for, for him to come in and, and be confident of, of doing a really good job here? Well, it's always a guess as such. It's never proven until the results, and results to decide everything. Same with Joe, same with every head coach. It's a results business. So if he wins a lot more matches than he loses, then it'll be a success. If he starts losing more matches than Ireland have been used to, then he'll be under pressure, and that's just the way it is. I think that I wouldn't worry me too much that he's never been a head coach per se before. Remember, Joe Schmidt never had been, really. He just came from Clermont O'Byrne as an assistant coach. Yeah, true. It was Joe Who. Around when Leinster, when Easton and Sayway recommended Joe Schmidt to Leinster, and they went and interviewed him, although the way McDawson tells it was more a case of Joe interviewing them. <laughs> uh, surprise, surprise. But, you know, he, he lost three of his first four games, and there was a few rumblings in the media, not from the camp at all. And uh, he went on to have an unbelievable success rate in the three years there. Uh, Joe has a 77% win, win loss ratio with Leinster and a 75% win loss ratio with Ireland so far, which is incredible figures mm. for a Leinster stroke Ireland coach. Since Andy has come in, Andy Farrell has come in, the win ratio has actually gone up to 80%. Like he's been a very, you look back to post 2006 Nations, 2016 Six Nations, and Andy Farrell has coincided with an upturn, a further upturn in Ireland's fortunes, during which time he's also been Lions defence coach twice. So he would have learned from Joe would have learned from Warren Gatland, and he's been in the firing line as an assistant coach with England when they host the World Cup, and that really is a furnace when you're coaching England. So I think he's built up a lot of experience. He's probably now a better coach now than he ever was before, like Joe. A hugely admired by the players. Um, it, for me, it was a no-brainer, really, and I'd say David Nusifora, like he does with a lot of things, had this planned a year or two out. Yeah, well, Simon needs to be in Richie Murphy, or contract through till June 2020, to, to be assistants there. How important is the other member of support staff going to be? Because he, he doesn't have a great background as an attack coach. Do you think that's the, the key appointment? And obviously, Stuart Lancaster's name is straight in the mix there. Well, it is, and, and I think it would, it would be, you know, it, it just makes sense, at least for Andy Farrell to approach his, his former boss and say, do you fancy jo joining this? You know, and it, look, it's a pretty attractive job, but it's a very important appointment because Ireland's, you know, Joe Schmidt has basically built Ireland's attack and managed Ireland's attack and, and owned it for five years now. And, and it's been, you know, it's, it's been successful. But it's very much his, and I think it probably needs to be. I think that, you know, Andy Farrell's going to have to put his own stamp on things, and by bringing in someone else who has, you know, a new ideas and freshens things up, will be important after that long with one man shaping the attack in, in order to kind of bring things on and to to to, re, to advance things a little bit. But it's going to be a key appointment. I mean, scrum coach is another one that he's going to have to do because yeah. Greg Feek's off. You know, the Irish scrum is, is is excellent. It's got really good players there at the moment, but still, very important appointment because Greg Feek's been crucial to all of that. But I think. Lancaster's a no-brainer, and if he doesn't want to do it, if he wants to stay with Leinster and further his, his legacy there, that's going to be a very important appointment, and, and that will be one that you know, he'll have to scour the globe, I think, to find the right person, because I think it's a big job. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because Lancaster was the head coach in England and Andy Farrell the assistant. If Lancaster was come aboard the Irish ticket, it would presumably be the other way around. Would that appeal to Lancaster or not? He's spoken in the past about the fact that when he was England head coach, it was 90% off-field stuff and 10% coaching. Yeah. When he became moved to Leinster, it was flipped the other way around, and he discovered how much more he enjoyed actual coaching. It possible that he might actually prefer being the coach on the pitch and let Andy Farrell be the head man and have the, kind of a slight role reversal. It might suit both of them, we don't know. He certainly would be the obvious choice and would tick the most boxes. Because if you remember Leinster pre Stuart Lancaster, the season before he arrived, and how much they just increased their try scoring rate, how much their back play improved, their ability to transition from defence to attack, in so many ways they became a much more potent attacking force under Lancaster. And then last season they probably tailored around a bit, found a really good winning formula and delivered a double. So Johnny Sexton, all the players that a lot of the bulk Leinster are doing a great job for Ireland because they're identifying all these coaches yeah. and they're also bulk suppliers. And all the players really like playing for Stuart Lancaster as well. So it would be, it would look like a very seamless fit. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see those two if they end up that way playing against England in a Six Nations. Would be a and also it looks like Leinster, have, Leinster have covered their bets a little bit by bringing Felipe Contepomi as well in case yeah. this should happen. Yeah, just on fire, like his personality is a big part of it. The players constantly reference the kind of aura presence he has. How important is that given the fact that expectations are going to be so high when, when Joe leaves? And the reality is there may be a dip. And he's a, he's a man who has lived his entire adult life and most of his teenage years in professional sport. He knows expectation. He, you know, he, he was at part of the biggest winning machine in rugby league for his entire career. You know, w Wigan, from when I grew up, Wigan were, were rugby league. They were the only ones who ever bloody won. So, you know, you've, he, he, he has, he's a winner. He's always been a winner. He's a serial winner. He knows what expectations are. He went to Saracens, winning machine. England, until that World Cup, were winning. And, he's, mm -hmm. and he has suffered the, the ignominy of that World 
World Cup exit, which I think is a huge thing that he will take and learn from. And now he's part of the the, the you know the most successful Irish team of all time. I don't think he he'll be bothered that much by expectation. I don't think he he will spend as much time thinking about the kind of what people are saying about him as probably Joe Schmidt does. I think he's probably more relaxed around that sort of thing. I think he'll be aware of it. But it's he's you know people have been writing about him since he was 15 or 16. Um, I I I don't think that's going to be an issue. I think it is. The expertise, the level of detail that Joe Schmidt, that the players have come to expect from Joe Schmidt, and whether he's able to follow that on, or how he goes about doing that, does he think? Well, maybe I need to let ease off on that a little bit because it's been so intense for a couple of years. It's going to be very interesting because, as we said earlier, Joe has owned this job so much and, and, and micromanaged so many different elements of mm. it that now you've got a, a different voice coming in. But it is a voice the players respect, and he will yeah. do it his own way. I think he's his own man who's been Pretty there quietly. So. Well, he's not that quiet, but you know, he's been quietly learning. But he's also taken the bits that I bits I want to use and the bits I, I don't want to use and he'll shape it his own way well we wish him the best of luck it's not going to be easy uh, the Guinness Pro 14 returns this weekend and we're in Cork on Friday night for Munster against Edinburgh that's from 7 on Air Sport 1 then on Saturday it's a double header up first it's the Cheetahs against Connacht from 2.30 on Air Sport 1 followed by the Dragons against Leinster at Rodney Parade from 5.15 also on Air Sport 1 ok that's all we have time for on the back row tonight my thanks to Jerry and Rory for coming in and thanks to you for watching we'll catch you soon